in a few days' time, my wife Amira and myself will be back home in Singapore, and we cherish your prayers. That's our home and also our base from which our ministry proceeds. I want to thank you, my dear brothers and sisters, for your very warm hospitality to us. And in these days, my wife and I have developed some good and enduring friendships. Uh, my dear brother Archbishop Foley and Alison, uh, thank you for your love and support and partnership and for inviting us to be here and for me to bring the word. I also thank Bishop Alan Hawkins and your amazing team for all the coordination and care. Uh, I thank God also for Archbishop-elect Steve Wood for extending to us the right hand of fellowship. And I cannot but remember uh, Archbishop Emeritus Bob Duncan because we have walked a long journey together and God has blessed in his grace the work of our hands. All across the cultures of the world, people give special attention to the final words of someone whose death is imminent. So when I get a phone call to say that so-and-so has passed away, I find I can't help but ask, uh, what did he or she say? What was his or her testament? What was the, uh, the person's consolation? What was the concern on the person's mind? That is how we are to hear the words of the Apostle Paul in this final chapter in 2 Timothy. He writes, the time of my departure has come. He is passing on the baton to the heir apparent of his gospel ministry. And he says with full solemnity and full desire, he says to Timothy, this is my charge to you. Proclaim the word. Be ready in season and out of season, which I have paraphrased in our final topic as get the gospel out into the world. Remember, my friends, that the driving purpose of this letter is to urge and strengthen a leader who is weak in himself to rise up and lead the church in a distressing time. And as we shall see, to lead the church by example into mission. The letter has been a stirring exhortation from Paul to Timothy, not to shrink back from suffering for the gospel and from all the problems in the church's life, but to rise up and fulfill the ministry God has entrusted to him. And all the more because Paul would soon leave the field of ministry completely. And as our African brothers and sisters say, to be promoted to glory. Amen. What a fitting description of death. Timothy, I exhort you to guard the good deposit by the power of God. Timothy, I exhort you to grow in holiness, to be wonderfully effective for God. And now, Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God, proclaim the word. Firstly, then, the priority to proclaim the gospel. We are in chapter 4. Helps if you have your scriptures open before you. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And this priority is there in verses 1 and 2. Preach the word, be ready in and out of season. Preach the word. The word in context here is the gospel. We are to proclaim what God has done for the whole world through Jesus of Nazareth. It's the historical Jesus portrayed in Holy Scripture. The kerygma, the nucleus truth that captures God's saving action for the world and that gave birth to the church. It consists, the kerygma, what we are to proclaim, consists of two parts. First, that Jesus died for our sins, forgiveness of sins in 
his name through repentance and faith. Second, that Jesus was raised from the dead for our justification. Romans 4, 25. Raised to put us right with God forever. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the charisma, the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that proclamation is needed to generate saving faith. The faith that saves us and gives us new life now and life that does not end but continues in full communion with God. That faith is generated by the proclamation of the gospel, the charisma. Hence, Paul in Romans 10 writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The proclamation of the gospel. That is the priority for Timothy and the church. Yesterday in chapter 3, at the end, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So our ministry is all-encompassing, this a proclamation of the good news. But at the heart of it, and it cannot be missed, there is one essential work in the midst of all the good work, and it's the proclamation of the gospel to those who have yet to believe. The challenges to proclaiming our faith at the present time, the secularism that excludes and is suspicious of religion, the relativism that questions the notion of absolute truth, the immense suffering in the world that causes people to doubt the claims of having a good and all-powerful God. These are the difficult conditions of our times, but together with Paul, we are here at this assembly to declare, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the saving power of God to all who believe. This proclamation generates saving faith and transforms lives. Saving faith and transformation for the college professor, for the down-to-earth businessman, and for the villager on the Himalayan heights. We were with uh, Archbishop Stephen Than at the assembly about 10 days ago in Egypt, and he was sharing about what does it mean for Christians to be part of the peace process in that conflict-ridden land where there is so much suffering. And this is what he said. What is required of Christians? First, prayer. Second, mediation. And third, he said it, proclamation of the gospel because only the gospel changes human hearts. So, beloved, let us preach the word, which means proclaiming the gospel publicly. And in the context of all of Scripture, we know that the proclamation is aided by good works and deeds. And that's why I'm so encouraged by the Matthew 25 initiative. Preach the word. It's us. This word is for us and for the people we lead. Because one of the things COVID did, uh, because it stopped all our programs and public assemblies, it made for us in Singapore, it made a transition that the responsibility to share the good news, proclaim the good news, and to disciple is now in the hands of the person. Personal evangelism. 
and personal discipleship. So in my mind, I'm thinking of a time we opened our churches at certain hours for pastoral care. And there I was in the cathedral. And here comes in a mother on a wheelchair. And she can't help but tell me, my son, my son, she's a teacher. And her son is an adult in professional life. She said, my son brought me to Christ. Not a church service, a public speaker, but my son. So this proclamation is not to be just on the lips of pastors and uh, Christian workers. It's on, to be on the lips of every believer. And we need creative ways of making the story of Jesus known. The gospel finally is a story. He lived, he died, he rose again because of his great love for us. Notice the solemnity and urgency of the charge. Notice the first words. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living, those who are living at the time of his return. And all the dead prior to his return will be raised to give account. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, pointing to the Lord's return and at the coming judgment, the final judgment, all will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So take note, my dear brothers and sisters, the charge to preach the gospel here in 2 Timothy is not based on the great commission, but on the great judgment. Because there is a real heaven and a real hell. And our Lord knew it. So it won't be inappropriate to say when Jesus gave the great commission to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them and to teach them and, and, and to bring them into the kingdom, when he did so, he of all persons knew better that there is a real heaven and a real hell. And that on the day of God's final judgment, every person will be conveyed, consigned to one or the other. Uh, you, do you feel the urgency? This is the truth revealed in Holy Scripture. So it puts energy, the energy of love in our souls and a church of all ages and of different gifts and graces unites to proclaim the gospel. So, dear brothers and sisters in ACNA, let there be a growing momentum of planting churches and leading the lost to Christ. I learned just the other day that there are 50 million persons of the diaspora from other nations who have landed in the U.S. 50 million. What a mission field. As I share this with you, I also want to share a caution, something we need to be aware of. Father Cantella Mesa, aware of how heavy-weighted, how lumbering sometimes the institutional church can be, and for him it was the Roman Catholic Church, aware of that in terms of the immense heritage of dogma and liturgy, he warns that such churches are at risk of neglecting evangelism if they do not rediscover and sustain the original nucleus of the church's teaching. And the original nucleus is Jesus died and rose again. He is Lord of all. We need to sustain that and move with that. So Paul goes on, be ready in and out of season. Be ready at all times to proclaim the gospel. Don't be affected by whether or not your preaching comes at a convenient time for the hearers. Well, it, we don't barge in. We don't barge into people's lives. But neither are we overly sensitive about how comfortable they are because their eternal destiny is at stake. There is no other name. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so in love, we boldly and humbly 
proclaim. I was reminded of this, my friends, on a long flight from Singapore at that time, earlier this year, to London. And I was there, and I was having my Bible open and paper to write notes. I was actually preparing my sermon for, the, for landing. And this stewardess, noticing that I was engaged for most of the flight on this, she came and asked me, how do you understand this book? An Ethiopian eunuch moment, friends. <laughs> Someone comes and asks you, how do you understand this book? She had some background. She came from a Roman Catholic school. How do you understand this book? And surely she had needs for which I had to let her know the God I serve cares for your human need. But I want to just testify I didn't stop there. I went on to tell her the kerygma that Jesus died for your sins and he's alive to put you right with God and to renovate your life. I proclaimed it. And I said to her, if you are ready, I can lead you in that prayer. You can seal that decision. And this is 30,000 feet above a sea level. And, but she did. She did. And so I just share that with you. Be ready in season and out of season. Then Paul goes on, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. That gives us a strong hint. It's not just proclaiming it and helping people to enter into the kingdom, but to ground them as disciples. So it's not hit and run evangelism but adding converts to local churches where they can be discipled, not least by the pastor's teaching ministry in which he reproves, that means corrects, rebukes, warns, and exhorts, urges. So we are patiently to hold forth the truth and teach it clearly and in due care. That's what he says there as he urges Timothy to be ready in season and out of season, rebuke, reprove, verse 2, rebuke and exhort with complete patience. Patience because people will not always heed sound teaching. Complete patience and with the truth. The priority of proclaiming the gospel. Secondly, the robustness needed to stand and proclaim the truth. Verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. There is a battle going on. It's already present in the church in Ephesus that Timothy is pastoring. But Paul is looking beyond. It's going to get worse, Timothy. People are going to choose untruth to satisfy their appetites and they will accumulate false teachers who will bring a teaching that suits their itching ears. That's what's going to happen. There's going to be a battle with false teaching, the battle between light and darkness, the battle between God and Satan. Things will get worse because people will not have an appetite for truth but out of their base desires, choose false truth. They will become susceptible to the father of lies. They will be deceived and they will be led by Satan, graphically portrayed in the book of Revelation. Today, Bishop Willie, in his prayer, was led to lead us to pray for a new day. So we come to terms with the darkness. Thick darkness will cover the earth, Isaiah writes. But you know what he says? Arise and shine, for your light has come. So as we draw close to the end of the assembly, may you experience the unstoppable 
inconquerable light of God who loves the world. God does not fold his arms. He moves his troops to bring light, life, love, salvation to the world. I believe that Satan and the rulers of darkness have released forces of uncreation, climate change, the shaking of moral foundations, the wickedness and the hatred that is demonic. But in the midst of uncreation, God is bringing consummation. Her light shines, the battle intensifies, the victory already won, already won on the cross through the resurrection. He reigns and he'll bring complete victory. So we are to be aware that fallen man will open the gate for false teaching, for the enemy to exacerbate darkness. You need to watch out, my friends, for the cult of helpfulness. What I mean is, people these days just want things that are helpful. They're not interested in the truth. We have a different commission. We are to proclaim the truth. We are not to be so consumer-oriented that we cut the cloth to fit the person. We declare God's truth, which truly is liberating, humanizing, and which lasts forever. So I believe that the light will break forth. As we heard from Luke 1 in our Holy Communion service at the church, in God's tender mercies, there will be the rising of the dawn from on high. May you believe it. We need it. The battle is intense. But we stand on a stronger word. We do, beloved. Jesus said, I am building my church on what you just said, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I am building my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So with that, Paul gives counsel to Timothy. Many are going astray, but as for you, verse 5, always be sober-minded. That is, self-control. Don't get carried away and don't get unduly um, angry. Stay steady and teach the truth. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill all the duties of your ministry. The priority of proclaiming the gospel, the robustness needed to stand for and to proclaim the truth. Now, finally, the reward that is worth it all, the reward that awaits the faithful servant of God. Paul writes, for I'm already being poured out, we are in verses 6 to 8, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So Paul is thinking of the Old Testament sacrificial system, Numbers 15, where there is a drink offering. Wine is poured out together with the animal sacrifice, perhaps the burnt offering. So here we are. We pour out our life on this side of eternity. And at the end, there is the drink offering, our life laid out on the altar. Paul's language, a living sacrifice. So my life, because he knows he's not going to return to the field. This is going to end in his execution. But for him, it's his departure. This word departure is pulling up the ten pegs. I love your camps uh, during summertime. And every time the camp ends, you lift off the ten pegs and fold the ten. And that's going home, beloved. And that's how Paul has this serenity. Do you sense it when he says, I have finished the race? I'm pulling up. The time of my departure has come. Or if you like, a ship setting sail. 
and the last rope is thrown on shore and the ship sails forth into the horizon. Mark 6 says, before you know it, you're already there. Are you ready to go? For Paul, he says, yes. Glory to God, I have fought the good fight. It's the fight of, or the contest in an athletic race. So it's not a military fight. It's competing in an event at the games in Rome, perhaps, where there's a contest, but I fought it. I finished the race. I've completed the race. No mention of competing with others. Just so blessed that he has completed the race God set for him. And he's kept the faith, which has the emphasis, I've been loyal to God's trust. I have completed and kept all that God has entrusted to me. What is laid forth up for him on the other shore is a crown of righteousness. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. So you can picture the laurel a wreath, you know, that the winner of the game, the race, receives. What does he say? This crown of righteousness. It's righteousness in all its fullness. It's always been a righteousness from God. That's how I read the text. I boast of no righteousness of my own, but the righteousness of Christ in all its fullness when I'm in glory. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. There's no merit here, my friends. He's not thinking about, you know, I've sacrificed so much and I've worked so hard. He's just thinking together with others. I've worked and lived because I loved his appearing, his return. A good time for you and me to ask, what is the prize that you are looking for? All of us look for a prize. Uh, what is the reward? The reward is the prize that satisfies you. And of course, in ministry, there are many prizes. Recognition, power over people, uh, status, etc. Many, many prizes. Public recognition, an invitation to the White House. So what's driving you? Because without that, you will never, be re you will never feel rewarded until you get the prize. That's how powerful a prize is in shaping our lives. What's your prize? Well, we're invited here. The prize is the crown of righteousness on that day. It's not here in this life. It's when he returns. Is your prize laid up in glory when you see Christ face to face? Paul is urging Timothy, let the return of the Lord be the one thing that shapes your life work. The return of the King. His delight in you and your fullness in his righteousness. So when we finish, my friends, may we finish like Paul, certain to where we are going, knowing that everything is in the Lord's hands. I hope you captured this serenity. Distressing times, and there's so many threads still loose, but I fought, I finished, I'm home at last. Because God is the author and sustainer of the church's mission. God will be there for Archbishop Steve Wood. God will be there for all successing leaders until he returns. I want to end also, I hope you too, with the appetite intact. I don't want to end, if you like, you know, exhausted, maybe angry and or regretful. I want to end like Paul with the appetite, this gospel which saves the world, this gospel which is the gift of God, must be proclaimed because God desires that none perish because all are precious to him. So I conclude three uh, topics we covered, beloved. I summarize them for us. Guard the deposit by the power of God. Grow in holiness to the glory of God. 
and get the gospel out into all the world in obedience to God. Please would you stand. A moment now for the fire of the gospel to be fanned into flame. Lord, we come and we thank you that we can come as we are. Give us the grace of your love, a holy zeal, a humble boldness to faithfully fearlessly and urgently take the gospel to a world in need of your salvation. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Amen. amen.